From Los Angeles. I am honored to be the UCLA representative in this PAC 12 lecture series. My name is Laura Gomez and I am a law professor at UCLA. In addition to my um, academic training in law, I also hold a PhD in sociology, both, uh, both degrees from Stanford. And my remarks tonight are going to be a kind of a a melding of that work in sociology and law um, and, and drawing upon my book, um, Inventing Latinos, A New Story of American Racism. The central project of Inventing Latinos is this. How should we understand Latinos within the American racial hierarchy? Americans by and large, and I include those people who run the powerful publishing and media businesses from whom we all receive our information, uh, corporate CEOs, many people in Congress, and even middle and high school students, I would argue, understand the broad outlines of America's racial history as it applies to African Americans. For example, we agree, and I think most Americans understand that the first African slaves were imported into the original colonies in 1619. We know that slavery was protected and even enshrined in our constitution. We know that we fought a civil war over slavery. We know that President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And we know that the radical Republican Congress, without a single representative from the former Confederacy, enacted the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, known as the Reconstruction Amendments, which essentially remade our Constitution into the document that it is today. However, we also know that the promise of those changes was stopped by the Supreme Court in the late 19th century in an opinion called Plessy versus Ferguson, which enunciated the separate but equal rule, ushering in uh, Jim Crow de jure segregation in every state of the United States. And we know that that Jim Crow segregation did not end until there was mass protest in American streets. Uh, by Blacks and their allies that forced Congress and two presidents to enact the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s. But what do we know about the history of Latinos and their racial oppression in this country? According to the just released 2020 census numbers, 62 million people are Latinos. We live in every state of the union and in fact are concentrated in the most populous states. We are 20% of the population today, but we will be one third of the American population within a few more decades. And yet we are only 11% of the national electorate, 20% of the population, but only 11% of the national electorate. And the common misconception is that this gap exists because we are immigrants. But in fact, only one sixth of Latinos of voting age are not eligible to vote because they are not citizens. The larger reason we are such a small part of the electorate is that Latinos are too young to vote. One third of all Latinos are under age 18. While small nationally, the Latino electorate is substantial in certain states. Consider only the four most populous states. In New York City, I'm sorry, in New York State, Latinos are 15% of the electorate. In Florida, Latinos are 20% of the electorate. And in the states, the two states that are the most populous in the country, Texas and the wonderful state of California, 
we are 30% of the electorate. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Got a little tickle in my throat. <coughs> Latinos are composed of many national origin subgroups. Mexican-Americans are the Latino national origin group with the longest history in the US and by far the most numerous. Nearly seven out of 10 Latinos are Mexican-American and 80% of Mexican-Americans were born in the US. Um, were born in the US, meaning that their parents were immigrants or their grandparents or other uh, ancestors were, were immigrants. Puerto Ricans are the second oldest Latino subgroup in the US, having similarly been taken by the US in war after the Spanish-American War of 1898. And that means that for 102 years, Puerto Rico has been in political limbo neither a country with sovereignty nor a state with full rights. But it does mean that Puerto Ricans are free to migrate to the US mainland, not as immigrants, but as citizens. 9% of all Latinos are Puerto Rican, uh, uh, not including the population of the island. Although they have an outsized economic and political influence, you might be surprised to know that Cuban Americans are less than 4% of all Latinos. They came here as political refugees, thus with the right to become naturalized citizens within a year of arriving with government assistance and other benefits. Dominicans make up just over 3% of Latinos and most came to the US after 1970. Dominicans, Cubans, and Puerto Ricans together, Latinos with their origins in the Spanish Caribbean, make up 16% of all Latinos. Another 9% of Latinos who trace their ancestry to Central America, to El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And many came during the civil wars of the 1980s and 1990s, so they are a relatively recent population in the US. The remaining 14% of Latin American countries combined account for only 4% of Latinos. My conversation today, therefore, is going to focus on Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, Cuban Americans, Dominicans, and Central Americans. So I finished writing uh, Inventing Latinos uh, in. 2000, uh, in 2020, uh, in March of 2020, just as the um, just as the pandemic was picking up steam, just as uh, we were going into lockdown here in California, um, it turned out to be an opportune time for the book to come out because of the tragic murder by police of George Floyd in Minneapolis um, on Memorial Day of 2020, and the summer of protests that we had, which made people, I think, very primed to begin uh, thinking about and talking about uh, systemic racism. What I'm gonna do in the remainder of our time today is give you a thumbnail sketch, kind of a whirlwind uh, tour of the four core chapters of the book, which you see pictured here. And then after I run through a little bit about each of these chapters, I will save the last 10 or 15 minutes for a question answer session. And if you will just use your, if you will use the, uh, the mechanism on your, at the bottom in the center um, of your screen, you can go ahead and put questions into the chat and feel free to put those questions in at any time. If I, if I have a moment to glance at them and you know it's a question of clarification, I can answer it before the end of the lecture. Otherwise, I'll wait until we get to the end of the lecture. Um, 
So let's get started then um, with uh, chapter one entitled, We Are Here Because You Were There. In this chapter, I survey the long history of U.S. empire in North and South America, focusing, as I said, on U.S. intervention in Mexico, Central America, and the Spanish Caribbean. The argument that I make is that we must understand American imperialism and immigration to the United States as part of the same continuum. Even though U.S. intervention in Latin America took different forms in different countries and at different historical periods, it was all imperialism. Whether it was the outright military occupation in service of the idea of manifest destiny, which was the case in Mexico, as well as in uh, Central America, or whether it was for the purpose of extracting natural resources like silver, coffee, sugar, bananas, which was the case in Puerto Rico, Cuba, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, or whether it was for the purpose of connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, such as what motivated our intervention in Nicaragua and then in Panama or whether it was to provide access to an exploitable labor force in all of those countries. All of these types of US activity in the region constituted imperialism. In chapter one, I discuss two centuries of American imperialism. Um, today, 96% of all Latinos in the US trace their ancestry to Mexico, Central America, or the Caribbean, and therefore to understand immigration today and immigration of Latinos historically, we must understand that there has been this intense, um, cumulative, ongoing U.S. imperialism. And I think it's been particularly strong in Central America. And so I want to focus on that region. Um, whether we're talking about the example of Nicaragua, which we first had the Marines um, invade in the, early, uh, 19th, uh, in the early 20th century, um, or whether we're talking about um, the death squads of El Salvador, um, we have a similar story that has produced kind of economic dislocation in another country in Central America or Latin America, and then subsequently produced, uh, um, because of that economic dislocation, uh, migration within that country from the countryside to the cities, and then immigration north to the United States. Let me, let me give a, a more detailed example by talking about Guatemala part of the Northern Triangle that you are hearing about today in the news. American imperialism in Guatemala began with a multinational corporation called United Fruit Company. It was so closely linked to the US government that its lawyer, its general counsel, and its board members moved back and forth between the corporation and cabinet positions in Washington. In 1899, the United Fruit Company entered Guatemala and bought up the best land in the country for banana plantations. Um, during the 20, early 20th century, the corporation twice succeeded in, um, in persuading the US president and secretary of state to send the Navy in to force the Guatemalan government to allow it to continue to um, run its banana plantations in the way that it saw fit. However, in the 1940s, um, the US failed to stop a pro-union, pro-land reform 
uh, leader from being elected president. And in response, the United Fruit Company convinced the US government to stage a covert coup. And that action in the 1940s set off a 35 year civil war and a cycle of state sponsored violence in Guatemala that persists today. It included the murder of 200,000 civilians by military and police who had been trained at the infamous School for the Americas run by the US in Panama. And more than 80% of those killed were indigenous people from the Maya communities. The genocide and economic displacement caused by us is why so many Guatemalans are today making the treacherous migration northward. Imperialism and immigration are part of the same continuum. So why are we now surprised that Central Americans are seeking refuge in the US? I propose that we should consider reparations in the form of automatic asylum for immigrants from Central America, given the long history and harmful consequences today of our military, CIA, and corporate exploitation of those countries. In chapter two, um, I consider what I call the idealization of mestizaje and anti-Black and anti-Indian racism among Latinos. In order to understand where I'm headed here, we have to consider um, some background information. First of all, I define Latinos as people living in the US who trace their ancestors to Latin America and who are the product of what I call double colonization. <coughs> Excuse me, double colonization. Colonization in Latin America first by Spain and then subsequently by the United States. Let me talk about that. 400 years of Spanish colonialism in Latin America. The Spanish colonizers encountered 80 million indigenous people in the so-called new world. But of those 80 million, only 10 million survived Spanish contact, Spanish genocide and Spanish enslavement. And in part, it was because of the later labor shortage that those activities created that the Spanish then went on to import 12 million African slaves to the Americas. Across Latin America, the Spanish promoted a system of white supremacy, but it was not a system that banned marriage across the indigenous African descended and Spanish descended peoples. This was a very different system of white supremacy than what exists uh, exist under British colonization in the Eastern US, in Africa, and in Asia. And by and large, compared to Spanish colonizers, British colonizers sought to prohibit racial mixture, or what sometimes the law calls miscegenation across these racial groups. Um, so instead of prohibiting this racial mixture, what the Spanish colonizers did is they allowed it and then they created a kind of a deeper hierarchy um, of mestizaje or the, the degree to which one had that Spanish ancestry um, as opposed to African or indigenous ancestry. So along with mestizaje came something that we also have in the United States uh, historically and today, which is called colorism. Colorism is the idea that uh, whether you're an employee, talking about an employer or talking about people making individual decisions about whom to date or whom to marry, colorism is a preference for those with, it, those with lighter skin those with lighter skin within a particular group. So for example, 
it's very well uh, studied and well um, documented that among African Americans, those with lighter skin do better, whether you look at income, educational attainment, et cetera. Similarly, if we look at Latinos, what we see and what this chapter two is about is that Latinos who are um, have more visible African ancestry, Afro-Latinos, or those who have more visible indigenous ancestry are more discriminated against than those who uh, might have uh, more of a mestizo blend, which would be kind of the way that I look. Um, ha I have that ancestry, Af some African ancestry, uh, indigenous ancestry, and Spanish ancestry. Um, but those Latinos who have more African ancestry and more indigenous ancestry face greater discrimination. Um, one effect is visible if we look specifically at the Spanish Caribbean. Um, Caribbean Latinos generally underestimate their African ancestry to a degree that is confusing for others in the United States who see them as Black. For example, more Dominicans than any other Latino subgroup identify as Black, but that's still only 8% of Dominicans, and for example, 6% of Puerto Ricans. But we might, we might, um, those of us who are not Latino or even who are Latino but not Dominican or Puerto Rican might look at those Dominicans and might say that they are Black, but they might not identify that way because of the internalized anti-Black racism. Um, <clears throat> the majority of Puerto Rican and Dominican Latinos instead choose to identify as other race rather than as Black or um, or white. I'm going to come back to this when I talk about the 2020 census results and, um, and uh, Latinos in chapter four. The point of chapter two is to urge Latinos ourselves to face our own internalized racism that consistently favors those with lighter skin, those with great, great uh, phenotypical and with greater phenotypical um, appearance and cultural proximity to Spain as the original colonizer. Okay, let's turn to um, chapter three entitled The Elusive Quest for Whiteness. Mexican Americans emerged in the early 20th century, so uh, 120 to 100 years ago as a, what I call a buffer group, a buffer group between blacks below them on the hierarchy and whites above them on the racial hierarchy. Um, uh, so this kind of, um, I'm gonna just give you a few examples of this, about, about this kind of middle buffer kind of group that Mexican Americans have played historically and how it, serve to encourage and allow Mexican Americans to shore up their whiteness and distance themselves from Blacks in the United States. One example is something called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, was signed between the U.S. and the Mexican government in 1848. Um, at the time, the U.S. military was, uh, was, uh, had control over Mexico City um, at, the, at the end of the Mexican War. And um, when the treaty was signed, it included the transfer of half of Mexico's territory, actually, where um, most of the Pac-12 um, uh, universities exist today, right? All of California, um, all of the, the states along the U.S.-Mexico border, but also going up further to include, uh, of course, Nevada and Utah and Colorado and even parts of Wyoming. What is interesting uh, for the purposes of this discussion is that if you take that landmass, it was half of Mexico's territory, you know, and it's, it's kind of 
just hard to imagine the United States without that territory. Um, but if you take all of that um, Mexican territory in 1848 and you say, what is going to happen to the Mexican people, the non-Indian Mexican people who were living in that country? Well, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the U.S. promised to give them federal citizenship. And that federal citizenship happened for 115,000 Mexicans. So they were Mexican citizens one day, and then after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was approved by the U.S. Congress, by the U.S. Senate, I'm sorry, and by um, the Mexican Congress, they became American citizens. And this happened at a time in American history when only whites could become citizens in the United States, when, when African um, persons of African descent were not allowed to become citizens. So this is the first example of Mexicans kind of being in this in-between role they were treated much better than African Americans, right, at the time, but they were not, in fact, recognized as truly white. And this is what I talk about in chapter three. Um, I think what I'm going to do is give you uh, one more example and then from chapter three and then we will move on to chapter uh chapter four um actually i'm looking at the i'm looking at the clock and i think i'm just going to move on to chapter four but in in question and answer we can talk about more more specific examples i guess what i would i would say just to wrap up chapter three is that um over time because of repeated instances of discrimination, um, Mexican Americans began to decide and, and basically have a strategy of recognizing that they're not actually white and that they're not being treated um, with equality as whites. And so that begins to break down um, after World War II, and specifically in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, with the Chicano movement and the Boricua movement for Puerto Rican rights, both of which drew great influence from the Black civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. And today, we are beginning to see new trends visible in the 2020 census that I think reflect that the coming of the end of Latinos willingness to continue to struggle for this kind of marginalized white status that had has been a feature uh, in particular with Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans. Um, so with that, let's turn to chapter four on the census entitled To Count We Must Be Counted. Um, the census plays the role of making race in the United States by creating and defining racial categories. And it also illustrates the social construction of race because census categories aren't carved in stone. They change over time. And at a meta level, the census helps define the nation and who is in the nation and who is valued and devalued in the nation. Now, we tend to think of the census as today as enshrining the idea of self-identification. You get to decide what your race is. You get to fill out the census. Um, but this has only been true since 1970. Prior to 1970, it was a third party enumerator who decided what racial group people belong to in the census. They didn't ask them what racial group they belong to. They just put them in one or another group, white or black or, or Indian, most typically. And, and similar to that idea that the census changes over time, right? If we filled out the census in 1960, um, we might have been of one race because somebody was putting us into a racial category. 
But as of 1970, we were able to decide what racial category we were going to be in. Only since 2000 have Americans had the option of identifying with more than one racial group, right? I think probably if any of you who are are listening either synchronously or to the the uh, the uh, recorded version of this lecture, um, and if you're a young person, you're probably surprised by that because you just take it for granted that you can say, yes, I have a white parent and I have a black parent, or I have a, a complex racial identity and I can check more than one box on the census, but that's only been possible since the 2000. Now, um, the other, other point that I wanna make is only since 1980 were Latinos even counted on the US census. Prior to that time, um, Latinos were considered to be just regional groups that were not important, important enough to be counted on the national census. So Puerto Ricans who were concentrated in New York and New Jersey, Cuban Americans who were concentrated in South Florida, Mexican Americans in the Southwest. Well, what changed in 1980 to lead to this result is a lawsuit that was filed after the 1970 census by a, a then new civil rights organization called the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And they sued the government alleging an undercount of Mexican Americans. And although the lawsuit wasn't victorious, it was dismissed by the federal court, it had the desired of effect of putting pressure on the executive branch and on Congress to create a, um, to create a, a so-called Hispanic advisory board that, that eventually led to counting all Latinos on the 1980 census. Um, now, let me just, um, I'm keeping an eye on the, on the time here. Now, what is interesting about that decision in 1980, um, well, there were two, there were, there were other, there was another group being added to the census at that time too. And that was Asian Americans. Now, Historically, um, as you may know, when the Chinese Exclusion Act was enacted by Congress um, in, the 18, in 1882, there was anti-Chinese racism and Chinese was added in the 1880 census as a racial group. And then a lot of Japanese immigrants were brought in to do the labor that, that was that Chinese were blocked from doing because they weren't allowed into the country. And Japanese was added as a racial category. Even though these are what we would call today national origin groups, they were added as racial categories. Um, but, but Asian Americans altogether as a group weren't added to the census until 1980. But this is an interesting difference. So in 1980, Asian Americans were added under the racial category as an option for Americans to fill out, but Latinos were not added under the racial category. They were added under something called the Hispanic ethnicity question. And this is why when you fill out, when you filled out the census in 2020, everybody has to answer two different questions. One question says, are you Hispanic or not? And you know, you can say yes or no. And then a separate question that says, what is your race? What I wanna talk about next is what Latinos are saying um, with respect to the latest data that we have from the 2020 census. Obviously this is not part of the book because the census was conducted in beginning in late 2019 and across all of 2020, and we're just now beginning to get that data. Um, and it's important to keep in mind, why is it that we conduct the census every 10 years? And 
the Constitution, of course, directs that we do that. The Constitution says in order for congressional, for Congress to be reapportioned every 10 years, there must be a national count of everyone in the country. Um, and so right now, with this new data coming out from the 2020 census, states and um, states are redrawing congressional districts and state legislative and city council districts based on how the population may have changed between 2010 and 2020 in a given state. Um, okay, so I want to talk about two things in my remaining time. First of all, I want to talk about three decisions the Trump administration made that really endangered the validity of the 2020 census. And then I want to talk about three ways that we are seeing Latino racial identification um, change in the 2020 census compared to the 20. 2010 census. So what are the three things that the Trump administration and Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross um, tried to do to um, delegitimize the 2020 census results? The first thing is that um, Ross, at the behest of um, the Trump administration, rejected the Census Bureau's recommendation to combine the Hispanic ethnicity question and the race question into one question, right? Rather than having these two separate questions, which a lot of people say is confusing, um, the Census Bureau did about 10 years of extensive research and said, actually, our data is going to be much better if we combine those questions. But the, the Trump administration refused to do that. A second move that the Trump administration made is that they tried to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census. Are you a US citizen would have been the question and had not been included on a census since 1950. Now, interestingly, the Supreme Court refused to allow the Trump administration to make that change. They did it on the basis of a kind of administrative law technicality, um, but it is still the case that I think many Latinos and many Asians did not participate in the census because they were afraid about the ramifica ramifications for identifying them as non-citizens. Okay, um, now a third move that the Trump administration made with respect to the 2020 census is that after the data had been collected, Trump directed the Census Bureau to exclude undocumented persons from the overall count of the population. The Census Bureau refused to cooperate, saying that this was a blatant violation of the Constitution, which requires that all persons be counted every 10 years. All persons living in the United States, not all citizens, not all voters, not all adults, but all persons. Um, so even though the Trump engaged in these activities to try to delegitimize the 2020 census, I, I, I believe that they failed. Now, part of why I believe that is because I look at what is the data that we're getting from the nation's 62 million Latinos that helps us understand um, how there are some big changes going on in terms of Latinx racial self-identification in 2020 compared to 2010. And there are three big changes that I wanna talk about in that 10 year period. Um, the first is with what I call um, uh, the number of census white Latinos. I call um, Latinos who select the white box on the census, census white, because there's a lot of research that suggests that even though these people are choosing white uh, on the race question, 
they don't actually think of themselves as white and they don't believe that other people see them as them, them as white. Um, in 2010, this was 53% of all Latinos who checked the white box. In 2020, this is a decrease down to 20% of all Latinos. A second change, a huge increase in those Latinos who identify as other race. And in fact, if you look at the 2020 census data and you ask the question, what is the second largest race in the United States after whites? The answer will be other. Other is the second largest race in the United States. And 98% of those who choose other on the census are Latinos. And this number has increased steadily um, from 1980 to the present. Um, and I think it's an interesting reflection of the increasing uncomfortableness that many Latinos have with calling themselves white. A third change in 2020, and that is a dramatic increase in the number of Latinos who identified with one or more race. And to be sure that one or more racial identification also could include white and some other race or white and other or other and some other race, right? Other and black or other and indigenous. In 2010, only 3 million Latinos identified with more than one uh, racial category on the census. But in 2020, that number went from 3 million to 20 million, representing one third of all Latinos. Uh, combined together, these 2020 results suggest that the vast majority of Latinos have left behind the the pipe dream of becoming white or pretending to be white in America. And I want to I want to close on this on this point and then I'm going to just see if there's any questions in the chat that you'd like to put in there or in the Q&A rather down at the bottom of your um, of your screen. I want to end with this. What is it that happened in between 2010 and 2020 that made these people change their mind about their racial identification? It isn't that all these people were born and were in the 2020 census, but weren't in the 2010 census. No, these are the same people who in 2010 identified as white, but then maybe 18 million Latinos who 10 years later said, no, I'm not identifying as white. And I wanna talk about a couple of things. One is what I call the Trump effect. And that is everything from Trump as a candidate announcing his presidency at Trump Tower and talking about how Mexicans were coming to this country were criminals, they were rapists, everything from that to the fact that you had specific uh, policies that were talking about the need for a border wall. And you had um, crazy people like a, a, a young white man named Patrick Crucius, who lived in Dallas and drove 12 hours to El Paso in August, 2019 to a Walmart where he, he figured he could stop anywhere in El Paso and he could just slaughter um, Latinos because he called them invading Hispanics in his um, social media post. And so you had this, this very intense anti-Latino racism on display at the highest levels of government in the US between 2010 and 2020 that really changed with the election in November, 2016 of candidate Trump as president. Um, but you also had an affirmative, I think, recognition of, of, um, of wanting to identify as um, 
as non-white, as people of color. And that really is where I go back, where I started, which is going back to the summer 2020, the massive and unprecedented, the largest protest ever in the United States, uh, in cities all over the United States, against police violence, the chanting in those rallies about um, the, the demand that systemic racism end. And I think that the 2020 census data signals that Latinos are collectively casting their lot with African Americans as people of color with all that that represents about who they are in this nation and is a kind of is kind of a final rejection of this idea that well we are white and we um, are as whites going to be distance our, distancing ourselves from blacks who are at the bottom of the American racial hierarchy. And with that, I would like to um, stop my formal remarks and just invite you to put any questions um, into the Q&A. And I'll wait a few minutes in case anybody is trying to put a question into the chat right now or into the, the Q&A function, which you should find. If you kind of go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and ampersand A, and you can just put a question in there that I will be able to read. So let's kind of, let's pause for a moment. I'll take a sip of water and you can write your question. And if not, um, I will um, I will go ahead and, and wrap up, but I thank you very much for, for joining me um, tonight. And I thank our, our tech team at the University of Utah um, for um, making this uh, possible. So I'm not seeing any questions. I'm happy to, to linger a little bit. And uh, if people are feeling shy, um, there we go. I mean, we have a question. Um, so I, I have a question. I'm going to read out the question and then uh, reflect on it. The question is, do you think that anti-Black racism among Hispanics has decreased in recent years? Are there still pockets of the sentiment in Hispanic communities? That is an excellent question. And I, I do think that um, overt anti-Black racism, <coughs> which I would actually define as having two strands. I do think it's decreasing, but I think it has two strands. One strand is racism against African Americans who are not Latinos, a kind of us versus them. But there's another important strand of anti Black racism among Latinos, which is anti Afro Latinos, right? There are those Latinos who are also um, have, have um, significant African ancestry, and that's another strong strand of that racism. And I would say that it is, it is still alive and well, because look, Latinos grow up in this country just like everybody else in this country, and we don't have any particular uh, inoculation or vaccine, vaccination against anti-Black racism. At the same time, I would say that um, there is increasing awareness, and I'm really glad to see a lot of the um, awareness of the fact that Latinos can be both Latino and Black, right, Afro-Latinos, a lot of that awareness, in particular in the popular culture realm, right, we see conversations about it in music, popular music, and popular film, and uh, media production. And I think we're talking about it and we're more aware of it. And I'm really excited to see that happening. But I do think we still have to fight it a lot. Um, 
Another question. Do you think that the Biden administration and upcoming administrations can counteract elements of the Trump effect? Or are they already doing so with certain actions? That is a great question. And you know, one of the very interesting things is that so, so as I mentioned, Trump rejected this proposal by the Census Bureau uh, statisticians who aren't really politicians, right? They're statistics folks. There was a proposal to combine the Hispanic ethnicity and the race question into one. And that was extensively studied and, and proposed, and that was rejected. So, so sometimes people say, oh, well, I guess we have to wait until 2030. But interestingly, the Biden administration is, is, yeah, there's only a census again in 2030. But what, what the Biden administration is doing in the meantime is combining that question through executive order, through the Office of Management and Budget, and through a lot of data collection mechanisms at the executive branch level, say, in the, um, in the Department of Health, um, in the Department of Education, and so forth. And so I actually think that's a very positive move, and it's emblematic of what the change in administration can bring. Now, that said, I think there's also fair criticism against the Biden administration for not going as far as, um, as many Latinos, not all, but many Latinos would like in the immigration realm, right? And so I think that's a, a really, that's an area where I think that there's that, that tension that you see in the Democratic Party between the moderate Democrats and the more progressive Democrats is really divided on the question of immigration. Um, there is a third question here. There is clearly racism in Latin American countries themselves where Spanish descendants are quite prejudiced against people with indigenous blood. Does this prejudice come with immigrants to the US? That's a great comment and question. And I kind of short-circuited the second chapter, but it's all about the fact that, that with those four to five centuries of Spanish colonization in Latin America, we have a very deeply entrenched anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism in Latin America. So, so to be sure, Immigrants who come from Latin America come here and they've already got an anti-Black and an anti-Indian uh, uh, racist mentality. But I will also say that most Latinos are not immigrants who just came from Latin America, right? They are people like myself who've been here, you know, in, in my case, on one side of my family, four generations on another side of my family, you know, since before in the Southwest since before it was the United States. And so we can't blame that on Latin America, our racism, right? We have to, to blame that on the United States. So I think, I think both of those interact together in these um, interesting ways that kind of produ produce this effect that I'm calling double colonization um, in, my, in my study. Um, I think there might be another question. Um, and so this question, and this will be the, the last one that I, um, that I take, or actually maybe I could take one more after this if you wanna sneak in another uh, quick one. But the question is, what is your view about considering people from Spain as Hispanic? And what about Portuguese and Brazilians who don't speak Spanish? That is a very sophisticated question. And, I have what I hope is a subtle uh, answer. Um, so I very deliberately offered you a definition of Latinos that focused on people in the United States who either themselves immigrated from Latin America or whose ancestors immigrated from Latin America, um, and who therefore are the product of these double waves of colonization, first by Spain and then by the US. And that was a definition that very strategically left out 
people who are directly from Spain and Portugal who would come to the United States as immigrants and and live here. So I am I am suggesting that those people who come from Spain directly are European immigrants. And therefore, I don't think they are Latino within the kind of racial hierarchy analysis that I'm talking about. But, but you know, on the other hand, I would say, if I, people are Latino, if they choose to identify themselves as Latino, right? So I don't want to rain on anybody's parade in that way, but that, that is where I would come down on it. And I think similarly, speaking about Portuguese immigrants and speaking about Brazilians, of course, Brazil was, was colonized by Portugal, not by Spain. In, in my book, Inventing Latinos, I was, I was trying to, um, I felt that in order to be able to say what I was saying, in particular in chapter two, about the legacy of Spanish colonization, that I just didn't know enough to speak about what that legacy of, of Portuguese colonization was and how that might be um, at play today, right? So, so I feel like um, it wasn't, it's, again, I think that a lot of people would say uh, people who are of Brazilian descent in the US, um, not a huge population, uh, but you know, those people, if they want to say they're Latino, I think then they're Latino. But I think they have a, a quite a different experience. And so it becomes, I think, as a scholar, it becomes challenging. And then there's one more question, and this will be the last question. It's a follow up to the last one. This is similar to the question whether people from Africa should be considered Black or African American. U.S. institutions like our universities go out of their way to include as many of these people within these categories as possible to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion numbers. Ah, that is that is a dynamic that I'm very interested in and very familiar with, right? So the 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 comment is really saying, um, is it, and we hear this most often in the context of um, African American. Uh, say those those universities which are are still engaging in affirmative action. And I have to say that as of um, 1996 in California, we haven't been allowed to engage in affirmative action, so we don't have this particular dynamic. But in those universities where they still are able to engage in affirmative action, as the Supreme Court allows, um, there's oftentimes the beneficiaries of affirmative action are more likely to be African immigrants, immigrants from Nigeria or immigrants from uh, the Black Caribbean rather than African Americans who are descended from slaves in this country, right? Um, and that creates some some kind of a disconnect because if we think of affirmative action as being designed to remedy and, and be a form of reparations for that enslavement and then for the Jim Crow legacy after slavery, then it's kind of a mismatch. And I think you're right that there's a similar debate among Latinos about, um, you know, I hear it all the time about those Latinos who, who might have come to the U.S. as, um, you know, as adults from Argentina um, or from Venezuela, as opposed to Mexican Americans or Puerto Ricans who really come from uh, generations of, of exclusion and racism in the United States. So it's, it's a definitely a, a topic worth discussing more. And it's one that I, that I talk a lot about in my other context in my critical race theory uh, uh, course and my work that I um, engage in um, at UCLA School of Law. So I really enjoyed talking with you today and I um, appreciate these questions and, and comments very much. And I just wanna thank you for spending part of your evening with me. And also for, for those of you who watch this on a videotape in the future, 
um, uh, thank you for, for taking time to view this material. Thanks very much. Um, have a good evening.